Another question they're definitely going to ask you that you're gonna be like, what? Is, do you have a cat? Hello to all of my beautiful birthing people. Welcome back to my channel. You're looking absolutely beautiful today. If you, like me, are kind of rocking like the Zoom meeting work from home outfit, I applaud you. I am wearing pajama pants. I'm kind of like a mullet party on the top, real casual in the bottom in this case. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about some questions that I have gotten a lot in my DMs on Instagram, Nurse Abe over there if you want to follow me there as well. The question that I get really often is like, hey, I've gotten a positive pregnancy test. Like, what do I do now? Or like, what does it look like with my first prenatal appointment? Like, what are the things that I'm looking for? Picking out a doctor, etc., etc., etc. So today I wanted to kind of cover like, what to expect from your first prenatal appointment. And I want to specify that this is from my experience and also from some research that I did online because I just wanted to kind of double check. I am somebody who goes to an OBGYN practice, so I see primarily doctors, although they do have a few midwives on staff. It's not a midwifery care model. I am in the eastern coast of the United States of America, just to give you a little bit of context. But if you have experiences that are different than mine, I would love to hear them in the comments. So I really think this can open up a really good avenue of conversation and just take away a little bit of the mystery behind like what's going to happen at your first prenatal appointment? What should you expect? So to start off, I want to kind of talk just a little bit about a question again that I get pretty often. It's like, I've gotten a positive pregnancy test. Like, what do I do? Okay. If you have a positive pregnancy test, you are pregnant. There might be a change in that at some point if you suffer from a chemical pregnancy where it's like a really early miscarriage and you start bleeding and the your test becomes negative or if there is like a few other really, really rare things that can happen. But false positives in pregnancy tests are actually super rare. So if you get a positive pregnancy test, congratulations, you are pregnant. And the first thing that you want to do is well, if it's your first pregnancy, who are you gonna see for your prenatal care? That's a question to ask, right? What are you looking for? What are you hoping your birth is going to look like? What does your insurance cover? Do you need to work to get on Medicaid for pregnant women in the United States? All of these questions are gonna kind of factor into your next step, but your next step, regardless of the answer, will be to call and set up a prenatal appointment. And I really recommend, as soon as you get that positive pregnancy test, to call and set up that first prenatal appointment because even though statistics have said that our birth rates are going down, I feel like there are a lot of people falling pregnant right now, myself being one of them. And so getting your, your appointment on the earlier end of things will make sure that you are seen in like a quicker fashion. If you wait a few weeks, which if that makes you feel comfortable, that's totally fine. They're not gonna see you in those first few weeks of pregnancy anyway. But if you wait a few weeks, you might not be able to schedule that first prenatal appointment until a little bit later because all of the slots will be filled up. So just something to think about. Once you get your positive pregnancy test, go ahead and call the provider where you would like to deliver. Now in selecting a provider, here are the things that I want you to keep in mind. If you're planning for hospital birth and you have different hospitals that you want to look at in your area, leapfroggroup.org is a wonderful organization that kind of compiles a lot of lists of things like cesarean birth rates, episiotomy rates, things that you want to know for yourself so that you can make a really good choice. Now one caveat to this is leapfoggroup.org did not update for 2020, so all of their records are from 2019. Some things have changed more than likely, you can always ask your OB about that in the office. The other thing that you're going to want to think about if you have the option is, are you thinking you would like a midwifery care model where you're delivering with midwives, more low intervention, low risk birth, or are you somebody who already has a host of medical issues where you might need to be followed more closely by a maternal fetal medicine doctor, or a combination of the two together, which can definitely happen in a hospital birth setting. So figuring all of those things out, and then I think it can be really valuable to gather information information from those around you. So friends who have delivered, if you are part of any local Facebook groups, asking there, 
but also keeping in mind that each person is going to have their own unique experiences and there are going to be people who rave about one group and people who also say horrible things about the same group. So taking each with a grain of salt, figuring those things out. I also want to let you guys know, and I, I hope that this is obvious, but you can make a prenatal appointment. You can go to that prenatal appointment. You can sit down with the doctor at that prenatal appointment. You can have an interview with the doctor because they work for you. And you can be like, I don't think this is a good fit for me. And you can go somewhere else. This is not a binding marital contract. They're finding out information about you, but you're also finding out information about them and information about their group and information about their practice. I have a video, 10 questions your labor nurse wants you to ask, I think is what it's called. I'll link it up above, kind of goes over all these things. So typically your first prenatal appointment is going to be scheduled anywhere from about six weeks into your pregnancy to 10 to 12 weeks into your pregnancy, just depending on the provider that you're delivering with and what their specific policies look like at their practice and also just how busy they are. So at your first prenatal appointment, it can be really beneficial if you have records or labs or any pre-existing conditions that you are able if you have access to those things, you can bring them to your provider. They also are gonna be able to get them if you don't have access, so that's totally fine. Something else they're also gonna review with your medical history is what medications are you taking? Sometimes are concerned with certain psych medications. Some of them 100% aren't safe for pregnancy. And some of them you need to weigh the risk of having a significant mental health issue, having tried many other medications and finding the one that works really well for you and your mental health concerns versus the risk to the baby and almost 100% if these are not something that are totally not okay for pregnancy, your OB is going to recommend doing what's best for your mental health because overall having a person have stable mental health and not having significant mental health issues during their pregnancy, during their postpartum period is what's going to be best for the baby long term. But they can always work with your psychologist, work with your primary care physician if they're needing to adjust medications. If you are wanting to adjust your medications or go down on certain medication dose, how to do that safely, both for you and for your baby. A lot of women of childbearing age in the United States of America, and maybe even globally, I've often found, and myself included, do not have a PCP, a primary care physician that they see regularly, even though they totally should. Um, and I am literally the pot calling the kettle black here. But um, when you go to your first appointment, it's important to remember that it's going to be like any new intake. So they don't just care about your obstetrical history, they care about you as the whole picture of you. So this is gonna involve asking you questions about your past medical history, asking you questions about your past psychological history, which can be really, really important. As we know, we have psychological issues that can arise in pregnancy and in the postpartum period. So having that history to follow up with you is really gonna be important. They're also going to be taking your vital signs. They're going to be listening to your lungs and to your belly and looking at your skin. And they're going to be doing some sort of gynecological evaluation as well, but they're gonna be looking at you as the whole picture because we know that there are a lot of things that happen in birth that are greatly affected by our pre-existing medical conditions and by our pre-existing health. Part of this intake evaluation and getting a really accurate medical history on you is going to involve an obscene amount of questions. Questions that you're like, why do you wanna know that? They're going to be asking a lot of questions about not only your past medical history, but the past medical history of your family and then also the past medical history of the father of the baby. And one reason why they are going to be doing this is because they're going to be evaluating for any sort of genetic anomalies that might have occurred in the fetus that you guys have conceived together. Kind of compiling your past medical history, your partner's past medical history, your family's past medical history all together is going to be something that's really important. They're also gonna be asking you a lot of questions about things like, what do you do in your spare time for fun? What does your exercise regimen look like? But also like, are you a big skier? Do you like to ride your bike? What about horseback riding? All things that your doctor may or may not caution you against during pregnancy because falls or injuries from that could damage your uterus and your placenta. Another question they're definitely going to ask you that you're gonna be like, what? Is, do you have a cat? 
And the reason why they want to know if you have a cat has to do with something called torch infections. So torch infections is an acronym that stands for a group of infections that can cross the placenta and affect the baby in utero. These infections are also known as vertically transmittable infections because they transfer vertically from the birthing person to the baby. The T stands for toxoplasmosis, which is the one that has to do with having a cat. If you are pregnant, you cannot change your cat's litter box because cats can get this infection called toxoplasmosis that will be excreted in their feces that the birthing person could breathe in when they are changing the litter box. So can't change the litter box and that's why they care if you have a cat. The O stands for other. So lots of ones, right, that they weren't able to fit in this acronym. Syphilis is one, Vicella zoster is another, and parvovirus B19 is another one. The R in torch stands for rubella, also known as German measles. C stands for cytomegalovirus, which is a virus that is actually really common among children, so knowing if you're a teacher or somebody who works with children can be very important when we're thinking about cytomegalovirus. And then herpes is the other one, specifically genital herpes, which can have issues with vertical transmission during birth if you have an active outbreak or lesion. So these are all things that they are going to look at, look at what your risk is, look at how they can reduce your risk. So for example, not changing your litter box, washing your hands well when you're working around children, which we're all doing anyway, and we're masking at this point, most of us anyway. And then as far as like herpes, starting on a prophylactic regimen at the end of your third trimester. And if you have an active herpes outbreak to have a cesarean birth just for example. So all things that they're gonna kind of do at the intake at the beginning, look at your risk for torch infections because we wanna make sure that this pregnancy is safe and healthy for you and safe and healthy for bebe. Okay guys, future editing Elizabeth here. A few other things I forgot to mention. They're gonna look at your social history. Do you feel safe at home? Have you ever had thoughts of hurting yourself or others? Do you have safe housing? Do you have running water? Do you have electricity? Are you safe in your current environment? And what community resources might you benefit from, like a social worker or WIC? So in the time of COVID-19, I really would not be surprised if many of these questions about your lifestyle, about your health habits, about your family history is done over the phone because... It's just not something that necessarily needs to be done in person, unlike an actual physical assessment. And often this part of the health assessment is done by a intake nurse versus the doctor or the midwife. You also are going to be getting a variety of blood work done to screen for issues in your pregnancy and in your pre-pregnancy state. So they're going to be looking at your blood levels as far as red blood cells to be checking for anemia. They're going to be looking if you have any markers of syphilis in your blood work. They often also will do a chlamydia and gonorrhea screening and an HIV screening. And so these are all things that we will want to treat for if they are an issue and manage accordingly. Another thing that they look for in blood work is your rubella status. So have you been vaccinated against rubella and is that vaccination up to date? Rubella or German measles you receive in your MMR vaccine and this vaccination protects the birthing person from contracting rubella and rubella again is one of those torch infections that can affect your pregnancy and your baby and have some pretty negative consequences. You cannot receive the MMR vaccine in pregnancy so if you are rubella non-immune in your pregnancy they will vaccinate you in the postpartum period more than likely if that is your wish to receive. They also will more than likely ask to get a urine sample from you and in this urine sample they're just going to be looking at your urine and seeing if you have any sort of infection at this time, seeing if you have group B strep in your urine like I have with my last two pregnancies which means that I will be treated for group B strep with antibiotics during my labor and delivery process. They also are going to be checking to see if you are spilling glucose into your urine. This could be a sign that there might be some overt diabetes or some issues with some insulin resistance that you're already having early in your pregnancy that could set you up for having issues with gestational diabetes later on. So if you have not been to see your gynecologist recently, along with that physical examination, they're going to do a gynecological examination. They might 
ask if they can do a pap smear if you are due for those. Right now, the recommendation is to get a pap smear every three years. They are going to be looking for precancerous looking cells that need to be monitored closely. Typically, they will do a speculum examination and look at your cervix and visualize it. They might also want to do a digital examination. So checking your cervix, checking your cervical length and position, all of those things can be quite common at the beginning of your pregnancy to make sure that everything is looking good and to make sure that they are able to monitor that throughout the course of your pregnancy. They often do something called a bimanual palpation where with a gloved hand, two fingers inside of your vagina, they will feel the bottom of your uterus and then externally they'll feel the top and kind of press and see your uterus position. A breast examination is also something that they're going to do at your first appointment. And this just involves having your arm above your head laying flat and they just palpate your breast and feel your breast around to make sure that you're not feeling any bumps or lumps or seeing any concerning skin changes on your breast that could be indicative of some sort of breast cancer or lesion. They also obviously will be getting your height and your weight and kind of looking at your weight and your diet and your overall picture of health and helping make recommendations for keeping you as healthy as possible during this pregnancy. Big important reminder, you are so much more than your size and if you have a doctor that's solely focused on that, and that being the only picture of health, that's not really that helpful, but accepting and finding resources that can help you in your health journey during your pregnancy, whether this is referral to a nutritionist or somebody who can help with some exercises that are specific to you or anything else, that can be really beneficial. Remember that your OBGYN is somebody who can function as somebody who writes out prescriptions or referrals. So if you need to see a pelvic floor physical therapist, if you've had issues with painful intercourse or anything like that pre-pregnancy or things are getting more uncomfortable during your pregnancy, you can always get a prescription for a pelvic floor physical therapist from your OB. They are really great for the most part at giving referrals and trying to look at your whole picture of health and making sure that you as the birthing person are as healthy as you can be so that your baby as the person living inside the birthing person is as healthy as they can be. And these things also help with a smoother labor and delivery process as well. And the final thing that might happen at your first prenatal appointment, and again, everywhere is a little bit different as I saw from my video where I talked about all the different ultrasounds, you more than likely will have a dating ultrasound at that first prenatal appointment. Things to kind of keep in mind with the dating ultrasound, it is going to be more than likely transvaginal if it's before about 10 weeks gestation, which means that they have a wand that is inserted into the vagina so that they're able to see what they can see as far as your baby. Depending on when you go, those first few weeks, crazy things happen. So if you are seen at six weeks, there might not be a heartbeat at that point, and that can be really normal. There will be some other things, but there might not be a heartbeat. Seven, eight, nine weeks, you're gonna see like a fast change in like what your little tiny fetal pole to gummy bear looks like. I mean, it's truly amazing. So a dating ultrasound can be really beneficial if you aren't 100% sure of your last menstrual period, if you have irregular cycles, or if you just in general aren't really sure when you got pregnant, which happen sometimes and that's okay. Okay, so I hope that this video was helpful for all of you guys who are just now finding out you're pregnant, going to your first prenatal appointments, all of those exciting things. I would love to hear if you remember anything else from your prenatal appointments. I hope that all of you guys have a wonderful day and thank you so much for watching. Definitely, if you have any questions, leave them down below and I hope to see you guys soon. Bye guys.